But I really do want to welcome everybody to this afternoon's session in Appetite for Change. My name is Gerald Rector and I'm the CEO of Vic Health based in Australia. And Vic Health was the first world, uh, sorry, the first health promotion foundation in the world and we were originally established on the back of tobacco tax. But we now work in a whole lot of areas. So I thought today I'd just provide a little bit of a context around the discussion. Um, a little bit of the background of the work of Vic Health and particularly what we're doing the Behavioural Insights team here in the UK. So I think it's pretty easy and safe to say to everybody here that you all know that worldwide obesity has more than doubled since 1980. So that's more than 1.9 billion adults that are currently overweight or obese. And here in Britain, um, you're about to have 30 million obese people by the time of 2025. And in my home country of Australia, it's predicted that 75% of the population will be overweight or obese by 2025. So today we're exploring the narrative around obesity that we hear from a lot of politicians and journalists um, and experts, and that hundreds of behavioural studies have shown that eating is so much more automatic unconscious and influenced in ways that we just don't even realise. So people know that eating fatty foods and not getting enough exercise is bad for them. But those lifestyle factors that sit around us each and every day um, impact upon our health in ways that sometimes are subtle and sometimes we just can't avoid. They're deeply entwined into our consciousness and subconsciousness and it's changing behaviour and it's an incredibly difficult part of what we all do in this field. So to tackle the role specifically of food on obesity, as um, David Halpern mentioned yesterday in his keynote address um, in the introduction to the conference, um, what we're trying to do at Vic Health is do something just a little bit different and I'll just give you a tiny overview of that. So in collaboration with the Behavioural Insights team and the not-for-profit organisation New Democracy in Australia, uh, we've established a citizen's jury or a deliberative forum. Um, it's the first of its size and scale in Australia. It's being amplified by a media partner as well. And it's a way of engaging the greater community in a discussion about obesity and around food choices specifically. So just like a traditional jury, um, our group of people will hear evidence from a range of experts. Um, they'll hear from as many different people as possible from many organisations across industry, government, not-for-profit sector. And it's also representative of the Victorian population. And what we're going to be asking them to answer is the really simple question around how do you get people to eat better? So it's a ground up, grassroots, uncensored, People are a little bit nervous about it as a result of all of those things, but it's a way that we're trying to amplify some of the discussion in Victoria and Australia around how we get people to eat better. So it's just one of the ideas that came out of our Leading Thinker initiative in Victoria, and our Leading Thinker is actually David Halpin. He's been working with us for a year, and members of the Behavioural Insights team in Australia as well. And the idea of the Leading Thinkers initiative is to provoke some new thinking and try some different ways of thinking about public policy. So I'm really delighted to introduce our panel members. Firstly, Sam Cass. He'll be joining us via the fabulous Cisco video link. He's a food entrepreneur, former White House chef and senior policy advisor for nutrition. So I'll give you a bit more of a detail about Sam when we get to him. We also have Alison Tedstone here today is the national lead on diet and obesity and the chief nutritionist for Health and Wellbeing Directorate of Public Health England. And again, I'll give a bit more of a background about Alison when we uh, have the opportunity to speak to her. But our first speaker today is Brian Wansett. He's the John S. Dyson Professor of Marketing at Cornwall University, where he directs the Cornwall Food and Brand Lab. And the mission of Brian's lab is to discover and disseminate transforming solutions to eating problems. He's an award-winning academic researcher on eating behaviour, behavioural economics and behaviour change and has been published in the world's top marketing, medical and nutrition journals. 
He's a lead author of over 100 academic journals, um, sorry, articles and books on eating behaviour, including his most recent Slim by Design, Mindless Eating Solutions for Everyday Life, and the best-selling Mindless Eating, Why We Eat More Than We Think. His award-winning academic research on changing eating has contributed to the um, introduction of smaller 100 calorie packages to prevent overeating, the use of taller glasses in bars to prevent the overpouring of alcohol, and the use of elaborate names and mouth-watering descriptions in many chain restaurant menus to improve the enjoyment of food. He's also been working on removing 500 million calories from restaurants each year via Unilever's Seductive Nutrition Program. His insights have been presented, translated, reported and featured in television documentaries on every continent but Antarctica. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our first panellist, Brian Wansick. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you for spending your early afternoon with us here. I'm going to talk a little bit about Slim by Design, mindless eating solutions for everyday life. But if you have that need to drop off for the next few minutes, and you want something to dream about, if you only take one thing away from today, I want it to be this. That it's easier to change your eating environment than to change your mind. It's easier for you to put a bowl of fruit on the table so you eat more fruit rather than reminding yourself every day that you should eat better. It's easier for you to use a slightly smaller plate, maybe 9 to 10 inches, to eat less in smaller portions and remind yourself every day, I should eat 20% less at mealtime. And that's what we're going to be looking at, how we can do this in a number of different places. But first, let's take a look at this. Oh, poor America. <laughs> so how many people have never, ever, ever seen these trends of how fat we are state by state in the United States? Yeah, OK. They're, they're color coded, so the percentage of people who are overweight or obese is, uh, changes colors. The years go by from 91 to 96. 2003, being an overachieving sort of country, you know, we had to add new colors. And want to look at what would this look like in the year 2025 if these trends continued? Now, if, I don't know if you can see this in the back row here, but let's uh, take a look. Yeah, I, just, I actually just totally made that up. <laughs> that's not, that's not, but things are kind of bad. So here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at win-win activism. What we can do as individuals to change not just our communities, but to change entire countries. And we'll take a look at this. We'll start with Chinese buffets. Then we're going to move to school lunchrooms. Then we're going to go to your home and then to your country. Okay. A couple starting points. Do we know why we like what we like? And do we know why we do what we do? Because these are two of the underpinnings, not only of cognitive psychology, but also of economics. And the answer to both of these is no. We don't know what we like, and we don't know why we do what we do. But I'm going to show you by the end of the presentation that this is good news if we're trying to change behavior. Because if people aren't really sure what they like to eat and why they do what they do, there's a lot of ways that things can be set up to lead them to eat better without them actually having to come up with a New Year's resolution to do so. Let's look at this. Do we, know why we, do we know what we like? No, basically no. Okay. Um, we're tremendously suggestible, and our taste is very subjective. That, With the exception of real extreme things, let's say something that's rotted and a chocolate sundae, we are very suggestible. If somebody says, man, you know, that eggplant is really incredible today, what are you going to think when you eat the eggplant? A whole lot better. You're going to think it's a whole lot better than if somebody had said nothing. Let's take a look at what this looks like. A while back, this guy in the blue shirt came to me and said, look, he says, I got a great cafeteria here. This cafeteria sells all healthy stuff, but the problem is nobody buys anything. He says, what can I do? Well, we came up with a bunch of studies. One was very simple. We know that your expectations engineer your taste experience. So if you think something's going to be really salty and you taste it, you kind of go, God, it is salty. If you think it doesn't have enough salt, you're going to taste, taste the same thing and believe it's not going to have any salt to it. So what we do is we simply change the names of the menus. <clears throat> for two weeks, something would be up like a seafood filet. We'd take it off for a couple weeks. We'd put it back on and give it a slightly descriptive name like succulent Italian seafood filet. Now, it's just the same dried out fish stick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what happens? 28% more people take it. They rate it as better. They rate the restaurant as more trendy and up-to-date. 
even rate the chef as, been, as having more years of culinary experience. Now, the, the guy had actually just been fired from like Arby's two weeks earlier, but that's what people thought. But the crazy thing about this was there were seemingly no limits. Even when we gave things really stupid names, a bad chocolate cake, we called it Belgian Black Forest Double Chocolate Cake. Now, it doesn't matter that the Black Forest isn't even in Belgium. People are like, oh, Antwerp, I love it, yeah. But we found that this has no limits so that even the thing you first experience, the thing you first see when you walk in a lunch line, will have either a poisoning effect or it's going to have a halo on your entire experience. And we have a research restaurant, and one of the things we do is every Thursday, people come, they pay about 25 bucks, and they get a prefix dinner. But what they don't realize is we are always doing studies every Thursday on them. And one thing we want to look at is if you give somebody something that they think is going to be bad or good at the beginning of a meal, does it really change their entire experience? What we did was we ordered <clears throat> case upon case of this cheap $2 wine. It's called Charles Shaw wine. Anybody heard of it before? And they call it Two Buck Chuck. Yeah. Soak the labels off. We placed it with the labels that said it was either a Cabernet from California a place known for wine, or it was a Cabernet from North Dakota. It's kind of like being a, a wine from Iceland, okay? <laughs> now what happened is when people showed up that night, we gave half the, when people were seated, the waiter waitress said, hey, thanks for keeping the appointment. Um, we have a complimentary glass of wine for you. It's a, it's a Cabernet that's new from California. Uh, poor, 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 poor. For you guys, the same waiters or waitresses said the exact same thing. They said, we've got a complimentary glass of wine for you. It's a new Cabernet from North Dakota. Pour it in. Now, same wine, same meal. You guys love the wine. You love the meal. You made, many of you made reservations to come back within three months. You ate about 10 minutes longer. But you guys, even though it was the same wine, the same food, didn't have such a magical experience hated the wine, you hated the food, um, you left early, and when we asked if you wanted to come back for reservations, most of you said no. One guy even said no, he says I'm, uh, I'm really, really busy <laughs> for, the, for the rest of my life. <laughs> so let's take a look at what this looks like in real life. Unbelievable how suggestible our taste is. I'm Brian Wansink. Hi. To demonstrate that, Wansink tricked some of our own staff, seven of 2020's college interns. First, he added some chocolate sauce to vanilla yogurt. Then he told the students... We're going to be doing a little strawberry yogurt taste test. Okay. On the table, he had some strawberry yogurt containers. So if you could put your blindfolds on... The students put on blindfolds, tasted the yogurt, and then Wansink asked them to compare the strawberry tastes. I think they both tasted really strong with strawberry. All the students were certain they were eating strawberry yogurt. This one had a much stronger strawberry taste to it. No, it just tasted more like strawberry. With this woman, Wansink tried something different. We're going to be tasting a couple of different kinds of yogurts today. Okay. He didn't tell her what flavor it was, so when he asked her to rate the strawberry taste... Honestly, okay. I didn't notice it's strawberry. Okay, good. And yet, by the time I interviewed the group, she too had accepted the idea that she'd eaten strawberry. When you, like, follow up with a question like, which one is more strawberry, I was like, I had to choose one. They all believed it was strawberry. Actually, none of them was strawberry. It was vanilla yogurt with chocolate sauce. <laughs> Stop. That can't be. What do you mean it can't be? Well, I, I thought I tasted strawberry. I guess also, when I opened my eyes, the two yogurts in front had a strawberry on the box. I think you're joshing us right now. I do. Because I, I feel like they, there was definitely a taste of strawberry. No, it was vanilla yogurt with chocolate sauce. But you thought it was strawberry. Wow. It tasted like strawberry. I swear it did. <laughs> the moral to these stories, says Juan Sink, is that we are much less taste sensitive than we think we are. We don't want to really believe that we are duped or fooled by something as simple as the... And the amazing thing about that is that there's a ton of ways that you can end up guiding anybody to eat foods they typically don't like but which are healthier for them. 
We do this in school lunchrooms. We find that we can actually increase the sales of any, almost any vegetable dish by 20 to 40 percent simply by giving it a slightly descriptive name. It doesn't even matter how dumb it is, which I'll show you <laughs> in a few minutes. These things work because what they do is they engineer your expectations to think something's going to be different or more special than otherwise would. You can also end up being a heroic parent at home, too, simply by giving some of the description, explaining how it was made, things like this. Because again, if it influences our expectations, it's going to influence our taste or the taste of your children. Let's take a look at this other thing. Do we know why we do what we do? I know there's a number of people interested in policy here, and, and um, America is a very, has a lot of people interested in policy also. And one interesting policy that's been, that's been recommended in a number of times has been directed toward all-you-can-eat buffets. Because after all, they just cause us all to overeat and sort of eat till we blow up. So there's recommendations for uh, surcharges for individuals going there, a tax uh, for the places that have this. There's even zoning laws that are being considered to move like the all-you-can-eat Chinese buffet out to the outskirts of town where it will do less damage and stuff. But the interesting thing about all-you-can-eat buffets, I, I eat a ton of them because I travel a lot, but about a third of the people you see at any buffet are really, really skinny. Now, what is it that skinny people do at buffets that heavy people don't? Because if we knew that, it might give us some ideas as to what could be done to move or direct or guide people to eat healthier without them having to come up with a checklist or have a news resolution. Now the problem is you can't go to somebody and say, you can't go to a skinny person at a buffet and say, hey, what do you think you do differently that heavy people don't do when you're at a buffet? Because what are they going to say? Well, they either say, I don't know, or they say, I guess I eat less. Because we are really poor at trying to come up with why we do what we do. But what we can do is we can watch people. We can go and stare at 400 people walking to Chinese buffets across all of the United States and see what they do differently. And here's what we did. 12 coders, 370 diners. We observed people from the second they stepped in the place to when they left and coded everything from where they sat to what they did, what they talked about, who they're with, how many times they dropped their napkin, how many chews they had. Now, what do you think? There's five major things that skinny people do that heavy people don't of a face. Do you want to guess what one of them might be? Yeah. Okay. Um, when you can see the buffet. Yeah, that's exactly right. What we found is that heavy people were three times as likely to face looking right at the buffet where skinny people were about a third less likely to do so. They would sit with their side or their back to it. They also sat, on average, heavy, skinny people sat about 16 feet farther away from the food than heavy people. They scouted the buffet out before they picked up a plate. What they did is they'd walk around, they'd look at the food, then they'd go, okay, now we'll get a plate. Whereas in contrast to the heavy people tended to just go straight for the plate. Then they'd look at the first food and kind of go, yes or no? Yes. <laughs> They're also more likely to use chopsticks and if smaller plates were available, they are more likely to use smaller plates. But the thing is, what do you think people said when we intercepted them in the parking lot and asked them why they did what they did? What do you think they said? I don't know. No, if people really aren't aware, a lot of these things become habits that ended up making them, leading them to become slim by design over the course of their life, whereas that didn't work for the other people. But now, if we were in public health, we could say, okay, great. We're going to come up with people. We're going to come up with a checklist that people can use when they go to buffets, okay? Sit far away, face away, use a smaller plate, scout out the food, and use chopsticks, yeah, yeah. Now again, that's correlational evidence, that's not causal, okay? We have a saying in my lab, though, that if you wanna be skinny, you do what skinny people do. Okay, it's a good way to bet. But there's somebody else who's very interested in news like that. Buffet owners, okay? If they can get you, they don't really care what your health is, but if they can get you to eat less food, what they can do is save a lot of money. And shortly after this study was published, what we found was uh, we got a, got a call from somebody who says, hey, he says, you know, my, my dad owns some Chinese buffets in central Pennsylvania. So I was thinking maybe three or four buffets. He said, do you think the things that you do we can use to get people to eat less? And we said, yeah, and this is a great win-win example. So we worked with them. Um, actually, 
very, didn't work with them very long because it didn't take much time. But we worked with them to come up with a plan. So our plan was when people walk in, the host and hostess sits them farthest away from the buffet and then moves in as the tables fill up. Um, what they do is they give them smaller plates, they give them chopsticks as defaults, they can ask for, other, they can ask for a fork if they want to. To get people to scout out the buffet, what we did is we put the plates on the back side of the buffet so people had to at least walk around the buffet to pick up plates. And then to try to keep people from just staring down the peeking duck. <laughs> we put up some, a couple of those folding screens and some plants and stuff. So the guy disappears. I mean, it's just a, it's a long phone call. But he shows up about, um, about nine months later. And we said, well, how'd he go? And he says, well, he says it took a long time. Um, I said, how? I mean, those are just five changes. You could have made most of those over the weekend. And he goes, no. He goes, my dad has... 63 buffets. And I, I see why it took him so long, but I ask, um, well, how'd it go? And he goes, well, he says, right now, he says, we're on track to save in food costs uh, about $38,000 by the end of the year per restaurant. So there's a lot of win-win ways that we can look. And if we can come up with win-win ways that companies can use to get people to eat healthier, even if their intent is not necessarily to get people to eat healthier, but to be, make, be more profitable, that's going to be a very easy free market solution that can be done almost overnight. Well, let's take a look at how these things work if we want to change the way, let's say, 30 million kids eat lunch every day. Okay? We started something a while back called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. Right, right now it's in about... Um, uh, Right now it's in 26,000 schools in the United States and growing all the time. But it's low cost, no cost ways to get people to eat healthier. And a while back I got a call from the LA Times and they said, you know, we're going to get kids to eat better in school lunchrooms and here's what we're going to do. We're going to get rid of cookies, we're going to get rid of chocolate milk, we're going to get rid of everything except for tofu and escarole. I'm just kidding, but it's about, it's about that extreme. And, and they said, we did that for a year, he says, guess what happened? I said, People stopped eating lunch there. And she goes, well, how'd you know? Well, people always have alternatives. And to say no about something doesn't necessarily mean they're going to behave the way we want. They can also always say, I'm just never going to eat school lunch again. And what we find is three out of four kids who eat school lunches eat better than somebody who brings it from home. Because they're not bringing Coke and Cheetos to school with them. But there's other ways to do this. And let me give you got a call a while back from the New York State Department of Health. And they said, how do we get people to eat more fruit? How do we get kids to select 5% more fruit in the cafeterias? Well, they said, do we subsidize it? And how much do we subsidize it? And I think most decisions about food aren't made in an economic way. Okay, they're made in a very different way. They're made in a very sort of hot state. Let's take a look at a school lunchroom. Now, here we go. School lunchroom that <laughs> the fruits and vegetables, and rather the fruits, are going to be in a, a nasty chafer pan that looks kind of like a family-sized bedpan down in the darkest part of that line. And you can make it free and kids won't take anymore, but here's what we said. Do this. Put it in a nice bowl and put it in a well-lit place. Don't change the price, just do that. Um, five schools in this district did so. Sales didn't go up 5%, they went up 103% and stayed there for three months. Um, Two schools didn't do it because, after all, you know, it's obvious and it won't work, and their sales went up 0%. And one school did it wrong. And I tell you this because making these changes are so weirdly robust that you almost can't do it wrong. This, this school said, uh, when we met with them, we said, how'd it go? And they said, you know, I think uh, we messed up. You know, what do you do? And they said, well, we, we put the food in a nice bowl, but then we um, um, took a desk lamp, out of the closet and put it next to it and turned it on. <laughs> we said, well, how, how did that go? And she says, well, oh, sales went up 183%. So now I'm like, two suggestions. Put it in a nice bowl next to a desk lamp. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, if we take a look at another call, this is the U.S. Department of Agriculture call and said, look, we're trying to get people to eat more salad in high schools. Two-thirds of all high schools have salads. People don't eat it. Do we add more stuff or should we subsidize the price? Let's take a look. 
People walk in, junior high kids walk in, the door up there, there's a la carte items, hot lunch line, salad bar, which is really like, it's like mulch, okay? <laughs> it's like stuff is composting on that salad bar. It's been there so long. And one of the things we said is, well, don't do that. Let's just move the salad bar so people have to walk around it to get to the cash register. And so one of the things we find is that the junior high kid with his hat on backwards has gotten pizza for the last 97 days of the year, school year, walks and bam, he hits that salad bar. Where'd that come from? Well, that continues for about two weeks. What we find after two weeks is salad bar sales went up 200 to 300% simply by moving the silly salad bar. Now, there's tons and tons and tons of these changes that can be made to make it easier for kids to take the healthy stuff, leave behind the other stuff, but at the same time, not have a reason to say, I am never going to eat school lunch again. Now, one of the things we did, <laughs> so in our challenge is we've come up with a plan that any school can use. They can redesign an entire cafeteria for less than 50 bucks. And we first launched this. We just gave people a little bit of a taste. This is in the New York Times. But we showed, here's what a new lunch line would look like. And we say, look, um, we find the first thing a person sees they're 11% more likely to take than the third thing. So have your healthiest stuff first. We find that simply having that sign that says, you know, dinosaur tree broccoli or whatever, um, sells 28% more broccoli than some that just says nothing. We also have a sign. But what we find is that it doesn't matter how poorly people implement these things, they still work. There we go. Hearty vegetable soup. Shutter, grilled chicken roll, kind of a do-it-yourself thing, I guess. Still works. Let's take a look at this in real life. The masterminds behind the cafeteria redesign are Cornell University professors David Just and Brian Wansick. I wanted to know how they're going to basically trick teens into eating right. So what are we doing here? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of the milk, put it in front so if a person's thirsty, at least they have the option of picking something up. At least they have to reach over the white milk if they want to pick up right. a uh, flavored sugared beverage. Step two. They took the pizza, which was the first thing in the lunch line, and moved it towards the back. And the veggies and the healthy bean burrito moved right to the front. Step three. They renamed the healthy food. We find that changing something as small as calling these mixed vegetables, California blend or the big bed bean burritos increased sales <laughs> by about 27%. Step four, they moved the fruit from a plastic tub into a pretty fruit bowl. And finally, they took the cookies and put them just out of reach. They're gonna have to ask one of the food service workers to help pick it up. We think that's just enough of a barrier to keep some percentage of kids from saying, eh, whatever, I'll have an orange. The professors rolled up their sleeves, made their changes, and now it's lunchtime. Oh, there she's getting her tray. She grabbed a sandwich. She's getting an Arizona iced tea, I think. An orange juice. Ah, oh, and she got the cookie. So, Samantha, this time you didn't get the cookie and you got a piece of fruit instead. Why'd you get the fruit this time? Why, why do you think? I don't know. <laughs> and this was an unbelievable success. Fruit increased by 102% simply by putting it in a nice bowl. The sweet drinks were also harder to get to, and Jane, Marcy, Richie, and Levante fell right into our trap. Last time they grabbed Gatorade, Snapple, and Arizona iced tea, but this time... Well, the water was just in front, so I just grabbed it. Sales of sugary drinks plunged by 17%, while purchases of easy-to-reach milk soared 46%. Whatever was easiest to reach, that was good enough for them, and that was enough to get them to change. Another hit, the Big Bad Bean Burrito, sold out for the first time ever. The professors say, on average, students' plates this time around contained about 18% fewer calories, and they made healthier choices. Now, the way we've been trying to transform school lunches is not by changing the food, but just guiding people to the healthy food that already exists. And so there's a self-assessment scorecard that's being used by over 25,000 schools in the United States. But even if you look at this, it gives you a score from 1 to 100. Okay? If you get a 1 or 2, you're probably making your kids fat by design. If you're getting a 60, 70, you're doing the right thing. But the important thing is, is once you fill this out, you know what points you're missing. Let's take a look at 
Uh, if uh, white milk is available in all service areas, you get a point. Okay? If white milk is in at least two or more locations, you get a second point. If at least one third of all your milk is white milk, fourth point. If white milk is in the front of the cooler and chocolate milk's behind, you get another point. So you see how that works. And our objective is that by the year 2020, we will have 70% of all schools in the U.S., abroad, hopefully, too, will get a 70 or higher on this. It gives some idea what's going on. But we can do the same thing in your home. And I'm going to show you where you're, whether your home is making you slim by design or not, whether it's making you healthy or whether it's making you heavy. It's a 10-point thing. You can keep tracking your fingers if you want to. If you uh, get a one or two, not too good. If you do better than that, you know things are going in the right direction. So what we'll do is you keep track of your fingers, and we'll compare how you do compared to the Royal Swedish Academy, to uh, the world, the economists at the World Bank, and to the American Association of Home Economists. Okay, Ready? First, if salad and vegetables are served and eaten first in your house, give yourself a point. And then they're eaten first, then you actually bring out the starches and stuff. Second, if the main dish is served or pre-plated from the stove or counter, give yourself a second point. Our research shows you'll eat 20% less of anything that is not sitting on the table. Third, if your dinner plates are 9 to 10 inches wide, give yourself a fourth point. Again, our research shows you serve 22% less on your plate if it's between 9 and 10 inches. Larger than that, you overserve. Smaller than that, you go back for seconds because you know you're fooling yourself. Fourth, give yourself a fourth point. If you sit eating at a table with a TV turned off, okay, not like a computer table, I mean a kitchen table, dining room table. Fifth, if there are two or fewer cans of soft drinks in your fridge, give yourself another point. Six, if your kitchen counters are organized, not messy, give yourself a point. We um, have a series of tests labs, and one of them looks exactly like a house, and we have a kitchen, we brought people, bring people in the kitchen, we have three snacks here in the kitchen, we make them wait half an hour for a late person to show up, they can eat all they want to. If we make that kitchen clean and organized, except for the three snacks, people eat 44% less than if instead we have mail strewn around it and things like this. Seven, if pre-cut fruit or veggies on your middle shelf, give yourself seven point Eight, if there are at least six single servings of lean protein, it could be two, two tofus, two yogurts, <laughs> two turkey breasts, whatever, give yourself an eighth point. If all snack foods are in one inconvenient cupboard, in the United States, in the typical house, the typical house has an average of six cupboards. Four to five of them have snacks in them. If all of your snacks are in one cupboard far away, give yourself another point. What our research shows is that people claim to snack about 23% less when that happens. And last, if the only fruit on your counter is a fruit bowl, if the only food in your counter is a fruit bowl, give yourself a tenth point. Yeah. How many people had over five points? Very, very good, very good. Very good. I think what you find is, um, on average, the typical family has about three to four. If they rate it really honestly, they have three to four points. Um, Royal Swedish Academy had about six. The World Bank had about three, and uh, home economists have about six. Okay. So let's take a look at our country. What can we do as a country? Well, you can help make your country slim by design. Score your stores, your restaurants. Okay, there's scorecards. You can find them at slimbydesign.org. Let them know. Let your favorite store, what, your favorite restaurant know what it can do to help you eat healthier. It's going to be win-win if you end up going there more often because they make those changes. You can organize an activism group. There's an action guide that can help you there. So. You go right there and spread the word, and that's how it begins. Okay, who benefits everybody? So in conclusion, going back to you, where do you want to sit when you go to a Chinese buffet? Yeah, far away and face away. How do you get your kid to eat green beans? <laughs> Give them a name. Make them interesting in some ways. Where do you want to put in your home counter? Yeah, is it going to make a difference for the first two years, first two weeks? No. You look at it like it's almost a plant for the first two weeks, but after two weeks you find it disappears like that. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. Thanks very much, Brian. That was fantastic. Um, I'm now really delighted to introduce you to Sam Cass, who's joining us via video link from the States. 
And Sam, if you're there, I provided a really... I'm here. Hey, Sam. Welcome. Hi. So nice to see you. I gave you a really short introduction at the beginning, Sam, so I'll just do the full spiel now, if you can just hang with me while we're doing this moment. But okay. in 2009, the newly elected President Obama asked Sam to, to continue his work as a professional chef to the family and join the kitchen staff at the White House. In 2012, Sam helped create the American Chef Corps, which is an organisation dedicated to promoting diplomacy through culinary initiatives. During his time at the White House, Sam also undertook um, initiatives, but specifically was the executive director of the First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, an initiative dedicated to changing the way a generation of young people think about food and nutrition. He's one of the First Lady's longest serving advisors, um, having previously served as a senior policy advisor for healthy food initiatives, and he helped the First Lady create the major vegetable garden, which to date has yielded thousands of pounds of produce, feeding events um, guests, staff, and the first family of the White House. And Sam, some of my Australian colleagues were particularly interested also to note that you created the first beer ever to be produced in the White House. <laughs> and there's a recipe online just for everybody here. If you want to go and check it out, it's a fantastic video. It's called the White House yeah. Honey Ale. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool recipe. So go and check that out after today as well. It's Sam has recently joined the team at NBC News as their senior food analyst. So pr everyone, please join me in welcoming Sam. Thank you so much. Sam, just let me start a little bit of context and then I'm going to go over to you. So, um, certainly noting that after obesity has been rising for decades in the US, calorie consumption has begun to decline and obesity rates appear to have stopped rising for adults and school-aged children. Um, and actually in school-aged children, they've actually come down for the youngest children. And these, re these results do suggest that reductions are making a difference. So I guess my first question to you is, um, when you started this journey at the White House, what did you think was possible to achieve? Um, well, I was, uh, I, I was optimistic. I thought, uh, Everything was possible. I thought. I think we have no other choice but to solve these these challenges. It's taking such a huge toll on every aspect of our society, and um, so I was hopeful. I mean, I would say I framed. If we had one single goal, um, was to move this issue from the sort of outskirts of dialogue and debate, um, and the outskirts of our of our culture into mainstream America, and. Um, and I think we've largely done that. And I think it's been an underpinning of a lot of the change that we're seeing and a lot of the, you know, starting to actually see the uh, results and health outcomes. Um, and, and, but it has to be sort of front and center if we ever want politicians to start taking action. And Sam, what do you think um, Let's Move has done? So how much has, has that as a campaign been a big part of the changes that you're talking about? Um, I think it's uh, I think it's been a, a, a significant part, but it's been um, it's been one part of I think a broad cultural transformation. And I think a lot of times we want to focus on policy um, as sort of the the panacea of change, but actually all of that comes from our culture and what we're valuing and what uh, you know voters and consumers are paying attention to. And I think right now um, the cultural shift underway is driving. Uh, the consumption pattern changes we're seeing is driving um, and, and or at least creating some space for uh, policies to be crafted and I think um, there have been some policies that have been incredibly effective um, on the youngest generation of, of the youngest kids we made changes to the WIC program so the women infants and children's program which supports low-income mothers so that um, when we came in you didn't get fruits and vegetables as part of that support it's kind of hard to imagine. So we added fruits and vegetables to that package. We actually added more than additional uh, resources for that. Um, the changes in schools, I think, have been transformative uh, for our youngest kids and, and, and beyond. So, but, but ultimately, consumers are really deciding, and they're setting um, 
they're setting the trends. They're telling businesses that sort of the way we've been doing business isn't isn't working anymore. And I think Let's Move in the First Lady was um, very effective in galvanizing that kind of transformation, accelerating it, and creating a space where people who really wanted to become part of the solutions could could take some action and get some credit for it. So Sam, one of the things you've been fantastic at is talking to everybody. So one of the things you've been really great is being able to translate that message mm -hmm. to no matter whom you're talking to. So what's been your main message? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's evolved. I mean, I think we started with, you know, first of all, it's how you position the issue, I think is very important. And w the reason we focused on childhood obesity in the, in the outset, it's evolved since then, um, is because who's, who's uh, against making sure our kids are healthy? And so right there, you're creating a space where uh, everybody feels like they have a stake in it. And I think that's vital to building coalitions that are going to be broad enough that are going to actually make some change. Um, I also think that um, if this doesn't feel good to people, if this isn't uh, full of happiness and love, then I think it's, you're not going to get that much movement. So I, I've learned a tremendous amount from... Uh, the greatest marketers of some of the least healthy foods uh, about how you actually run a campaign and communicate a message. The public health community um, has taken the approach, eat broccoli, it's got fiber, it's good for you. And um, the, the food industry has always said, eat this, be happy, and be full of love. And love and happiness is going to beat fiber every single time. And I think we have to create the language that is welcoming um, and, and that inspires people to want to make better choices. I think you see, first of all, Brian, Brian Wansing is one of the great minds in this space and his, his work has informed so much of what we've done. Um, and you even see some of that in, in what he's talking about. When he says like, the, the consumption transformation when you just put a little sign, that's marketing. Now, it's not sophisticated marketing, but that's marketing in the school context. And it's it, marketing we know works, and that's been one of the, actually the big barriers to change. So I think as a community, we have to uh, uh, make it easier and more accessible, and that's what Brian's work really shows, that if it's easier to make a healthy choice, you're, we're going to make it, and we then have to inspire people to want to do it. And, and that's, those are the two main objectives, I think. And tell me about what it's been like to work with industry and to try and influence the industry. You mentioned that before, they're just so fantastic are talking about love, happiness, when you eat this particular burger or you take that soft drink. So yeah. what's it been like to work with industry from your perspective? Uh, mixed. Uh, <laughs> I, think, um, I think industry is diverse. I think, you know, we talk about industry as kind of this big monolith. Um, I, you know, but I, that's not been my experience at all. Uh, I think some companies genuinely want to do the right thing. I think some companies... Um, uh, are working really, really hard at it. Some companies want to do as little as possible and just keep selling really unhealthy food because it's a huge profit driver. Um, and and it's, there's everybody in between. I think sometimes you got to work with them. And I think the notion that we could fundamentally change what people are eating without working with the people who are producing all the food seems just silly to me. Literally, it just doesn't make any sense from a policy perspective. But at the same time, sometimes their interests are just not in line with the public with the public interest, and so you gotta you gotta draw a line and fight it out. And we've had a lot of big fights, um, uh, you know, a lot of fights around schools. But you know, in fact, just yesterday, um, there's been a lot of battle around the school nutrition changes that we made and the standards that we set, getting junk food out of vending machines and and, and raising the standards and in, in, throughout the entire school. But there's just yesterday I was reading an article about how the food companies that long were against this and invested huge resources in fighting it have now made the reformulations of, say, the whole grains or reduced sodium and et cetera, and now don't want the cha don't want us to cha like go back because they've now invested all this money. So you know sometimes you you fight it out and then you, then you're like okay now we've gotten to a better place and we can be supportive of of the next phase and. So I, I think it's push-pull. I will say that every company is worried about their brand. Every company wants to be a good actor to, to some more or less degree. And so creating an incentive where 
um, progress is supported is really important. I think a lot of times we stunt progress from companies who don't who take a good step but maybe don't go as far as we want. When they get land blasted in the press by advocates and others, um, it's a real disincentive for them to take the next step. So we should try to support, uh, I think, progress is, is one of my main takeaways from, from work on the White House. So Sam, you talked about initially starting with childhood obesity. So how mm -hmm. would you now take an approach to address adult obesity? So uh, the way the message has evolved um, is we went from focusing on the child to focusing on the family. Um, we know, obviously, the, the greatest determinant of the child's health is the parent's health. And so uh, we can't d divorce the two, although parents really don't want to be told what to do, although they are always eager to know what to do for their kids. But it, making the argument that we have to think about the health of the child within the context of the family and parents understand how their choices are affecting their kids, that's how I think the message has evolved. And that puts a lot more things in play. That puts employee wellness efforts in play. That puts... Um, you know, the grocery store and play in a very different way. It just, it broadens, I think, the, the playing field. And we know that those environments are shaping decisions um, every day. So that, that's, I think, where the sweet spot of the message is. We've got a couple of minutes left. So what okay. do you think are some of the specific problems that attempts to reduce obesity should address in the future? So where do you see the future in this space? And where are some of the opportunities that may arise? Yeah, so um, so I think innovation technology is is going to be a is going to have some transformational effects and transparency throughout the food supply, making access to healthier choices easier. I think basically it really, as I said before, it comes down to putting healthy food in arm's length of everybody that's affordable. So people have to work really hard to feed their families healthy, and and Brian's work shows this as well as anything else I've seen that if you have to really go out of your way and think too much about it, um, we're gonna fail. So setting ourselves up for success is one. And the second is marketing. I think the, a big front is, is what we market. Right now, the average child sees 5,000, in America, sees 5,500 ads for junk, for sugary drinks and candy, et cetera, and 100 ads for fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So long as there's that great disparity, we're going to continue to see uh, young people particularly making poor choices. So I think as a public health community, we need to dramatically increase our investment in marketing a healthier way of life. I think you can try to work to limit junk food marketing. At least in the States, the, the sort of legal authority to do that is quite limited. Um, so we just got to get in the game and fight it out and win uh, is, is basically, I think, the strategy. Um, but if we do that, if we do a better job of setting families up for success and then we leverage all of our uh, celebrity power and talent uh, to inspire people, I think those are the, some of the keys to long-term success. Um, just finally, we talked a little bit about it at the beginning, but I think it's important to hear about what you are most proud of in your time mm. at the White House. And as I said, you know, you've got a new life that you're undertaking now and your messages are continuing and you've got an incredible outlet with NBC. But with your time at the White House, what are you most proud of? Well, I was really proud of that beer, uh, let me tell you. <laughs> that was, a, that was, it was really tasty too. Let me just add to that. Uh, shockingly so, because we didn't know what we were doing. But, um, uh, what am I most proud of? I mean, I'm really, I'm tr tremendously proud of the cultural push that we were able to accomplish. I think it has spawned change that has trans transformed the country and has, you know, gone, gotten way bigger than, than we are. Uh, so that felt very good. Um, the work in schools, I think, you know, is, is probably the most impactful single thing we were able to do. Um, I mean, it got junk food out of vending machines added fruits and vegetables. Now kids have to take a fruit and vegetable. We're seeing significant increase in consumption because of it. Um, it, it was the first time that had been done in decades. And so that, that I think is creating a new normal for kids where that's just what they know. So where older kids have complained and we're getting through that for a kid who's five, six, seven, this is all they know. This is just, this is just what it is. It was never anything else. And that is over the long term where we're going to see that change. And that's happened in lots of places. And I think um, far, we don't have time to even begin to even scratch the surface there. But we've also, just as an aside, we, we did similar work in child care centers. So voluntarily work with over 15,000 child care centers who are 
not serving sugary drinks, not frying food, adding fruits and vegetables as snacks. Those are the kind of things from early childhood into schools uh, and throughout the community that we're only going to start to see the results in, in the years to come. I think we're just, I'm actually quite optimistic what the numbers are going to look like over the next, you know, three, four, five, and six years. So um, there's a lot of momentum, but um, obviously tremendous amount of work lies ahead. And I will say that the, I'll end by saying that the, what you're talking about today, Brian's work and all the work in behavioral economics, I think is maybe the greatest opportunity for cost-effective interventions that is not even begun to be untapped, at least for public health. Certainly has been untapped for selling unhealthy food to people, but not uh, for public health. So I think there's a, a front here that um, I hope is just at this very infancy and in that we really leverage these solutions because it's everything else, most other solutions cost a lot of money. Um, the brilliance of these solutions is that most of the time they're very low cost and we just need the right awareness and will um, to help people uh, set themselves up for, for greater success in, in what they choose. So I'm very excited about this. I'm sorry I couldn't be there with you, but, um, but this is incredibly important work. Sam, thank you. And it's been fantastic to hear you talk about your work at the kind of scale as well across the United States. So everybody, please join me in thanking Sam. And thanks so much. I'll now um, ask Brian to come back on stage, but I would particularly like to introduce to you Alison Tedston, who's the who uh, works with Public Health England. So please come and join us up on the stage. So Alison is the national lead on diet and obesity um, and the chief nutritionist for Health and Wellbeing Directorate of Public Health England. I'm just going to spend a bit of time talking about Alison's background. She's responsible for diet, nutrition and obesity advice and policy at Public Health in England. Um, this includes nutrition surveys, food composition, scientific advice and messaging on nutrition and obesity and supporting local weight loss management services. She transferred along with numerous other colleagues from the Department of Health in 2013 and before that she was at the Food Standards Agency in 2010 and before joining the FSA in 2001, Alison was an academic at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Alison completed a postdoctoral research in Oxford and is a registered public health nutritionist. So please join me in welcoming Alison. So Alison, we've just heard about the kind of scale of change that's happening in the US and really interested to hear from your perspective about what's working here in the United Kingdom, because there's a huge amount of work that you have been leading and undertaking here. And so just for the audience, I guess, to really provide some context of the great work that you're doing would be great. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think in, the, in England, listening to what's been going on in the States, there are a lot of synergies and a lot of things that we have been doing. Um, I think that we now, for over 10 years, our schools, our, the school in our foods has been controlled. So children, for example, have not been able to buy fizzy drinks for a long, long time in our schools. We've been giving away free fruit probably for about 10 years in our primary schools. Um, and the policy challenge now for schools is perhaps the wider school environment. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, where there is now ongoing debate about what's happening around the school. If we think about our high streets, they are obesogenic. We've had, we've had a change in our food culture like many other countries. We ha now have far more opportunities to buy and eat than we have ever experienced before. In my lifetime, there's been a massive shift. Um, portion sizes have increased. Um, you can't even buy what's in our standard UK portion size book um, now for things like, things like drinks. There's been big, big shifts. We have, similar to the States, we've, um, but we are behind them, thank goodness. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're terribly obese. 67% um, of us have, have, as adults are obese or overweight. Uh, one in five of children entering primary school is obese or overweight. That, that's a public health disaster, really. And um, one in three, by the time they exit primary school, aged 11, is obese or overweight. So they've been on a terrible trajectory. I think we tend to model up what happens in the school with, with what happens around in, the, in families and in our society. What Brown was talking about in terms of 
all those cues that are going on for us to buy and eat more, I think we are beginning to think about very deeply, and some of that's being driven by our Behaviour Insights team and, and David's unit. Um, um, I think, you know, very nicely heard about what happens around our eating decisions, but our purchasing decisions layer on top of that. We have very cheap food in England. We have the cheapest food in Europe. Um, and we have a very heavily promoted food environment. It's very difficult to go into our supermarkets and resist buying more, resist those two-for-one offers, resist those 25% more things. And we know that year on year, sugar and calorie sales increase out of retail. The average man in England is consuming 200 calories a day more than they need. Um, and that's a lot. That's 8% that's, um, or so of their energy, energy requirement. Um, so we, need, we, we know that through we, the great success we've had in England is salt reduction. We've worked across the food chain to reduce salt levels in partnership with industry across the whole of foods. So, so what we are thinking about how to apply that more widely, sugar is the, the nutrient of the moment, is, is the next challenge. We have already seen some good work. We now have smaller chocolate bars on sale in England than we did we did a few years ago, that's great, but year on year we're still seeing increases in sugar sales. So I suppose it's the totality of effect that we're most interested in. Yeah. Um, and I think um, uh, the US data shows some positive tra changes for children, but the devil is in the detail, and that's for the most affluent kids in US society. Mm -hmm. And they're frankly not bearing the greatest health burden. It's their poor kids, it's our poor kids that are bearing the greatest consequences of, of, of societal problems around food. And Alison, you mentioned the work that has been led in the UK on salt reduction, and yeah. it absolutely is fantastic. And actually, we're using a similar model in Victoria and trying to lead that to drive the change across Australia, because we've been able to say it's working in the UK. Uh, we can also trial it in Australia. And you're about to do some work in sugar, which will be really, really exciting. Yeah. You just briefly touched on industry. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what it's like to work with industry? It's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey. Um, and I think it's exactly as, as Brian has already described, that um, industry want to... Uh, that, that their job is... You have to remember their job is to drive their... is to drive the, the bottom line, to drive their profits. Um, and that essentially means selling more. Salt is a great learning ground because um, you realize, uh, I'm, a, I'm a great fan in things happening behind the scenes in mm. improving nutrition by stealth, and that's the ideal example that you can do that. Um, and we've seen reductions in salt in um, almost every food, um, in food group. Almost every company has reduced the salt levels in their food. So the average pizza you buy in England now is lower in salt than the average pizza you, you bought um, 10 years ago. The average loaf of bread is much lower mm. in salt than it was 10 years ago. So the, the lesson for that is to working across the food chain. So you bring everybody with you so you don't have competition going on. And it costs a lot of money and takes a lot of time. <laughs> so. Before I um, ask Brian one more question and then we go over mm. to questions for the audience, I do just want to talk or ask you to comment on, I guess, what we call in Australia the Jamie Oliver factor. Yeah. So I know there's a lot of people from the UK here, but there's also a lot of people not from the UK. And he's a very prominent voice. Um, and I guess, is it a help or a hindrance from your perspective? It's a help. Having that uh, gr grit in the oyster, if you like, that, that person who pushes, 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 um, and is not the usual suspect. You know, I can say things, and I would say it, wouldn't I? <laughs> but having somebody who does not have a vested interest, who is doing it purely altruism, who is, um, 
in a way, speaking for the common man. It's a brilliant, fantastic thing. Um, and it's also, it, it's also, he commands a great deal of media respect. He commands political respect. Many pe he has a program this evening on, on sugar. I, I guarantee there will be lots of conversations across government about that. It's, um, it's, I, it can't be undervalued. I, I, I think without that kind of champion, it's very difficult to do some things. Jamie Oliver was instrumental in enabling the, the Mrs. Thatcher got rid of our school food standards mm. a long time ago. When I was a teenager, she got rid of our school food standards. Then we didn't have them for 20 years, and we desperately wanted them. The public health professionals desperately wanted them. But it took Jamie Oliver to go into number 10, to get into number 10, to go into to go into down the street and say, basically to shame the government into them. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't say shame the government, but enable them to happen. So, and you know, great. <laughs> and Brian, your presentation was um, really informative, and I think for most of us, it all just makes quite a bit of logical sense. But what would your advice be to policymakers around the globe now around what we can do? Well, I just had uh, a conversation with the Minister of Health this morning, and, and she asked me the same question. And, and, and the three things that I'd suggest is, first of all, <clears throat> use something like this, this lunchroom scorecard for schools, because there's no argument about the health of children. I mean, because when you talk to say, we should change what adults do, we're like, no, you're not going to tell me what to do. But nobody can really argue about trying to make children healthier. It's, it's a, kind of the lowest hanging fruit. And so I, I, but using a scorecard like that that doesn't cost any money, that tells people, look, if you're not doing it, here's what you can do, easy changes to make, would be the thing to do, number one. Second thing is that I think public health and I think governments have done the wrong thing for the last 20 years by saying, you know, the problem is not with us. The problem is the sugar industry, it's businesses, it's this government, it's everything else. Because what it does for us as parents they say, well, God, I guess there's nothing I can really do, so uh, I'm not even going to try. But our research has shown that about you can't control everything your child, your spouse eats, but as a nutritional gatekeeper, the person who purchases and prepares most of the food in the family, you can control about 73% of it. But it's for the better or for the worse. It's for the worse if you have a cookie dish. It's for the better if there's a fruit bowl. And the second thing I would do is, and this is when I was in charge of the um, nutrition policy and promotion for the government, we focused all of our nutrition education efforts not on telling people how many calories is in an apple. Nobody really cares. We tried to focus our efforts on empowering people to say, look, I, I'm, I'm going to make my kid fat or skinny one way or the other. I can't say it's not my fault. And I think that's good. And then the third thing I would do is I would start something that works with NGOs, nonprofits, and for-profit businesses. When I started in the US, we called it partnering with my pyramid, because my pyramid was the, the dietary guideline icon back then. We changed it to my plate. But we said, partner with my pyramid. You guys can do anything you want to be them sign a memorandum of intent, not a mem mem memorandum of understanding, but a non-binding memorandum of intent that they would make one change consistent with the dietary guidelines. They did that. We put their name on websites. They talked about it in presentations. We pat them on the back. We wrote letters for their annual report. And in less than nine months, 100 entities stepped up and made a change. Mm -hmm. And Alison, again, just one question, then I promise I'm over here to the audience. So I hope you've got yourself ready for some questions. But um, what do you think are some of the challenges of incorporating behavioural insights into the work around obesity? Um, I think challenges and opportunities, yeah. sorry. I, um, um, I think. The, the challenge, we are never going to be able to spend as much as the food industry and public health on, that, that, that's just naive, it's not going to happen. Um, I think uh, our budget is about 2% of the food industry's budget for marketing, so, um, and we're in a cost-cutting environment. Mm -hmm. So the challenge, I, I think the challenge is how to, how to rebalance with that constraint going on. The single biggest risk factor for a child being obese is, is having an obese mom and dad. 
being in an overweight family. And with so many of our parents obese or overweight, that's difficult. But I agree, you know, there is lots of control you can have. So, yeah, so, so it's the rebalancing of the food environment um, and not focusing entirely on information. So, as your point, not telling people how many calories there are in an apple. Yeah. We're going to um, have Sarah Cole, University of Brighton and Brilliant Futures. Um, yeah, I was just saying it was so good to hear so much work being done with the private sector. And I think we all acknowledge that we can't do anything without changing the environment and making it easier to purchase healthier food. A lot's been talked about um, taxing, making it harder, taking stuff out. What's being done to incentivize new entrants that provide better food? So um, it's a really difficult marketplace to, to operate in because the big companies can you know, have got all the resources to be able to promote heavily the, the food they already sell. Is there anything being done to incentivize people to produce better alternatives? Um, so that not only are we legislating against the bad, but we're promoting and creating more of the good stuff. So at a national, either in the States or in the UK. I can't speak for, um, the main, main government department are DEFRA and I can't speak about their work. However, if we think about say the school food standards. They, um, if a small company can meet those standards more easily than a big company, that's a big opportunity for getting into those types of places. We now have um, standards for hospital foods as well and exactly the same applies. So I suppose I can't really answer the question other than to say, grab opportunities. What about you, Brian? Yeah, uh, two points. The first one has been, there's been a lot of really cool innovations that have gone on with respect to portion size and repackaging things, resealable things, something, things that reduce the amount of calories per, a person needs per occasion. And companies have been extremely open to anything like that because it shows them how they can make more money again. The second thing, though, that's gone on that is interesting is the sporadic efforts across the U U.S. and one of them is a grocery store chain called Hannaford that had a Guiding Stars program where it says, look, we're going to give foods zero stars, one, two, or three stars, depending on how healthy they are. And we're going to have some standards as to what you're going to get. And what it caused a lot of foods to do voluntarily, companies to do voluntarily, is to reformulate their package, their foods, to make them a little bit healthier so they could get those, those, um, those stars. Bad news about that is that you're not really encouraging out of the box incredible thinking. You're only encouraging incremental sort of recipe adjustment. Quest, um, question down here, I think. My name is uh, Jasper Zure. I work for the Dutch Council for Public Health and Society. I really like the example of the all-you-can-eat buffet because I could clearly see the win-win situation there. And I'm trying to use that idea of the win-win situation if we can apply it to the rest of the industry like Coca-Cola, McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Can we find a win-win situation there? I mean, you just gave the example of different packaging, which might be a win-win situation, but I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on that because I really like the idea of the win-win situation. No, yeah, absolutely. Well, let me, uh, you're talking about restaurants. Let's take a, take a look at restaurants because people say, oh my God, restaurants just want to make you fat. No, they don't. They just want you to eat there. They don't care whether you throw everything away. They just want you to eat there, not at the place across the street. There's a lot of things that restaurants can do that can actually make a whole lot more money for them by making us eat better. We find, for instance, that a restaurant makes more money if they sell half-size portions because what happens, people stay longer, they might order something in addition, and even though they eat total, fewer total calories, the restaurant does better. We find that restaurants that actually sell healthy things, there's a much higher margin than a lot of healthy things than on french fries and stuff, so simply re positioning things on menus, using suggestive selling to sell that $12 shrimp salad that costs, has four cents worth of lettuce in it is a good thing to do. So there's a lot of win-win things that we need to look at in, in that way. With respect to a lot of food companies, what we need to help them think about are what are market opportunities for things that they hadn't thought about before. When we originally did the uh, research on the 100 calorie packs, I went and I drove it to Nabisco, to Atlanta Mars, to Kellogg's. And says, look, you guys can make more money selling less food. It was just, 
It's just silence in the entire room. And it actually took about three or four phone calls and a couple more visits before they said, I think we see. Okay. But I think it's, and I, Sam said something really, and I, I've agreed to this for a long time, but he articulated it really nicely when he said, look, if we are just beating up food companies and saying you're not doing enough, fast enough, they don't want to innovate. They don't want to play with us. But if we say, geez, that's really great. It's a great step in the right direction. All of a sudden, we're encouraging, I think, the innovation and the movement. But for us to think that they have the answer is not true. I mean, I work with all these insights people at all these different companies, and very few of them, I think, really have a lot of insights. They're really good at answering their email within seven minutes, but they're not, they don't really think that much out of the box. And so oftentimes it comes, if we can give ideas, if we can give suggestions, they'll make changes if they can see the, the thing. That's why I wrote the book Slim by Design, was to give a blueprint for companies and for communities to move forward. Alison? Um, I think I absolutely agree the portion size side of this is a really interesting win-win. I think sometimes, though, um, we, had, we have had chocolate size reductions, and an unintended consequence of that was backlash from some of the consumer organizations to say, we're being ripped off. And I did sympathize with the food companies over this because actually an awful lot of the cost of a product is not in what's in that packet. It's in the packet and the marketing around the packet. So I suppose people like Jamie Oliver actually are very important for trying to unpick that, that you're not necessarily being ripped off by smaller portion sizes. Um, so it's, it's complicated, isn't it? I suppose that's the bottom line. Hi, I'm Kate Brennan from Just Giving. Um, I just wanted to ask, I'm 100% with you in terms of tackling obesogenic environments and the role that has to play in obesity. However, I think when it comes to adults trying to help themselves, it doesn't really help that the media is constantly saying different things all the time. So like, low fat one minute, low carb the next minute, give up sugar the next minute. Do you think that that kind of information has a role to play in the situation that we're in? And if so, how do we tackle it? Um, this is... Did I deafen you? <laughs> this is my bugbear. <laughs> I, mean, I, I suppose if I could do one thing under legislation, it would be get control of, um, of uh, all the mixed messages out there. They're not coming from government, though. The government, well, we've just changed our advice on sugar. We've just recommended a hard, we, well, it's now government policy that um, the recommendation for sugar is half what it was before. But that's the first major change that, I've been involved in, I tell you, I've been around a long, long time. Um, people are selling books, they're selling their diets, food journalism brings in a lot of money, university media machines also are part of this. It's a very difficult thing to deal with. I can tell you, we have, in the nutrition team in Public Health England, we could literally spend all our resource on trying to, um, trying to deal with all those mixed messages out there. It's a really difficult nut to crack. Um, and um, we all love to buy food books, don't we? So we're part of the problem. You know, society's part of the problem. But that's a bit of a red touch paper for me. <laughs> you, had a big, you had a big reaction there from Alison, right? Yeah, that's a great question, Kate. I, there's a couple different perspectives to answer it from. Let's answer it from the perspective of, of a concerned consumer who's reading this stuff, is trying to make sense of it. I think that's the, the wrong way to actually go about eating a little bit better because what happens is you, uh, you end up being the sort of person who keeps a food diary and has a scale in your counter and stuff. And that's really not a sustainable way to go through life. But a better, I think, thing to do, in which there isn't a lot of conflict, I think, is to look at simple behavioral changes you can make. Having that fruit bowl, for instance, a small thing like that. And that's what I'd, if I was a consumer, that's where I'd focus my interest and energies. Question in the middle. Hi, um, yeah, I'm Nick Stanhope. I run a behavioral design company called Shift Design. Um, we ran a small experiment with school students in East London where we invited them to go out and buy a snack um, that they thought was healthier than what they would normally buy, but they still wanted. And they came back with um, low-fat, high-sugar yogurts with a health halo on. They came back with whole grain cereal with a, talked about, you know, being fortified with extra and They came back with oat bars that were full of fat and sugar. Um, and um, in their kind of food environment, it was almost impossible for them to make a healthy decision. 
Um, and bearing in mind they're not going to go out and buy fruit and salad in their <laughs> lunch break. Um, but you, everyone's being relatively kind with the food industry, but I feel like the more aggressive policies in some other countries, like in Denmark, where they've just banned the fortification of cereals with, um, with uh, a useless vitamins and those kind of things, and tried to really legislate against those hail payloads, which make informed consumer decisions almost impossible, they've had, a, they've had some success. I'm just interested in how you combat that complete mess of uh, consumer signaling and uh, kind of informed decision making. Ron? Well, you know, we did a interesting, that's a, that's a cool study to have them pick something that they think is healthier. We did a neat thing a while back, and it's a, it's a correlational study. We went into 240 households in one medium-sized city in the United States, weighed everybody in the household, and took pictures of every single thing in the house, everything in the kitchen, everything like this. And one of the things we found out is you can relatively predict somebody's weight based on the presence or absence of about nine things in their kitchen. But one of those things is, um, is if a cereal box is visible anywhere in the kitchen, on average, that person's gonna weigh about 21 pounds, about nine kilos more than their neighbor next door who doesn't have it. Because simply, it has the health halo. You walk by, every time you walk by, if it's fortified with vitamins and minerals, you take a handful. I don't think there's any policy that's ever gonna be effective that says it is illegal to have cereal on your counter. Okay. At um, some point, it's what we need to change. Th there's a piece of legislation pending in Europe that will address this that I am very keen to see come through. Um, it, it, what it will do is set a nutrient profile that food needs to pass before it's allowed to make a health or nutrition claim. Mm. So that means that um, a, a, a breakfast cereal couldn't have a high iron claim on it if it was also high in sugar. Um, I don't know that when it's going to happen, but as a nutritionist, I'm quite keen. <laughs> We've got a question in the middle row, just a lady there, yep, and then we're going to go somewhere in the middle here, because it's hard when you're in the middle of the aisles, you don't quite get the microphone, I'm sorry. Thanks very much. Uh, Theresa Barté in Cambridge. I want to build on a statement that you started with, Brian, about um, something along the lines of it's easier to change environments than the minds, which builds on that, that last comment. And to think in particular about portion size, which you, uh, Brian, in the work in your lab have, have majored on. And in my own group, we've just completed a Cochrane review, which will be published in two weeks' time, in which we pulled together um, 69 experimental studies on portion size um, in relation to food. And the bottom line is the effect size. We estimate that if, across the whole diet, it were possible for everybody to eat at a non-large portion, um, that uh, the amount of calories consumed per adult in the UK would be reduced by between 12 and 16% per day, and in the US between 22 and 29% per day. So this is huge if we could go for this. My question, we live in free market economies, and I'm also mindful of the comments that Alison has made about the devil in the detail, about the social pattern. Those who are poorest are increasingly the largest by quite, quite a margin. So going into a supermarket, one of the reasons why people's cupboards are full of this stuff in ever-expanding sizes is because the less you pay, the more you get almost. So, Building on that last question, mm -hmm. to what extent do you think this is something that needs regulation? It's something that there can be a win-win in negotiation, or we should be persuading people uh, avoid those aisles with all those special offers. Your thoughts on that would be yeah. great. Yeah, great question, and congratulations on getting that paper published. I, I look forward to seeing it in a couple of weeks. Um, <clears throat> A couple of things that go on, and there's a market opportunity out there for packages, and we've worked, been working with some cereal companies that have been considering having subdivisions or subdividing a package so that essentially you can get the, the economy of, of scale by buying something massive, but you can, it comes, it'll come in columns so that you don't end up opening all those. And I think that's, there's actually also that opportunity 
I'm a huge believer in warehouse clubs, and for 30 years I've shopped in warehouse clubs all of the time. And, but what happens is if you bring stuff back in those huge sizes and you break them into sub-packaging, it can work a lot better. So there's things that we can do as consumers that can make it easier for us to have the cost savings but not overeat. But there are also, I think, market opportunities for companies. And I don't think those have been explored very well because they tend to see big box retailers as the place where they just almost sell their commodity product without putting much thought into it. So I think, I think there's opportunities on, on both sides. A question in the middle here from somebody who, yep. Um, my name is Jacob Wright. I work for a company called Stay in School. We do marketing for better and healthier choices. We work in both the States and in the UK. And I find it very interesting that in the States, the private sector, there are a lot of very visible companies that are pushing for better food and better choices, and they're making a lot of money doing that. It's people like Chipotle and Whole Foods, for the examples. So why does the panel think that this is happening more in the States than it is in the UK, given how bad the situation has historically been for obesity in the States? Well, I, my question is, what's the net effect of that in the States? Are diets actually improving overall? Um, I don't know. I'm not in the States. I don't know. Well, I do know what their nutrition data is, and it's not improving um, at the moment. Um, so I don't know. I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, Ger not. Jeremy, I'm just, I'm just kind of guessing here, too. But it might be a market size thing that there's maybe three times as many people in the States. There's a bunch of real weirdo sub-segments of people over there being from there. I can say that. And so I think as a result, what it does is it offers a lot of different market opportunities for things that, that wouldn't, say, pop up maybe in, in, a company of 20, in a country of 20 million like the Netherlands or a country like this in the UK. But what, what we can hope, though, is once they get traction there and it shows that it's profitable with some sub-segment, that it's going to be the proof of concept that's needed to go elsewhere if it, really, if it, if it, if it works. But you, that's a good point. Up the back there, the lady in the striped shirt. Yep. Hi, my name's Alison. I work as a behavioral researcher for Swiss Re. Um, Brian, I was um, interested in, in some of your studies, if you'd seen any evidence of licensing effects and the, imp the impact that it had on the overall health outcomes, and if you had any interventions that were effective at mitigating the licensing effects. So three, sure. three yeah. questions in one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you want a really cool context of licensing, or is there a con context that you're interested in? Well, students, for example, reduced their calorie intake by 18%, but you know, did they go and overeat um, in their evening meal? Or did they reduce their exercise? You know, what actually happened yeah. to their overall weight? Yeah, so we, we've done tons, tons of stuff on this, and it's comp we call it compensation. Well, just two, two really quick examples. We, we took people, had them walk two kilometers around the lake, told them it was a scenic walk, had another group told them the same walk, told them it was an exercise walk, if people thought it was an exercise walk, they ended up eating 44% more dessert at the meal right afterwards. Because, my God, they, they deserve it. I mean, the easy thing for them to do, if that's what we do after we exercise, let's don't frame it as exercise, let's frame it as a break in our day. The second thing that's kind of cool, and this is really weird, and this is kind of controversial, is there's been some lawsuits in the United States when restaurants for firing overweight waitresses and waiters and stuff like this, because they say it's bad for business. We did this really cool study that it's under uh, review right now, where we studied 2,000 encounters with people and their waiters and waitresses. And what we find it happens in contrast is that if people have a heavy waiter or waitress, they spend a lot more money in a restaurant. They're more likely to buy a dessert, they're more likely to buy an extra drink and stuff. And so part of that is we find a licensing effect. You're saying, you know, I'm, I guess I'm doing pretty well. And so the key there is not to say, well, never then go eat at a restaurant with a heavy waiter or waitress. It's essentially saying, telling yourself, well, let me commit before I go to what I'm going to have and what I'm not going to have. And I can vary things in the margin, but I'm not going to make an audible call there to have three desserts. We've got time for one more question over this side. Yes, big hand that I can just see over the top of the, the gentleman there. Yep. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Matt Hagg from the Social Marketing Gateway. Um, I think the idea of controlling environments is excellent. Personally, 
any um, work at home to hide sweet things is great because then I, I don't know they're there. Um, <laughs> and there's plenty of things we can, can do to control an environment. But there's, in terms of behavior change, we still, that's only half the equation. There's still the person, the family, the children. Um, there's still a lot of work to do on how do we get them to be more empowered and better equipped to make better choices. And that, these days, even if, even if you're switched on from a health point of view, it's getting more and more difficult, as this gentleman said, on selecting a product that is actually healthy for you. So, you know, these low-fat yogurts have got loads of sugar in. And from the work that we do in some of the really disadvantaged communities, there's generations of people that really don't have the skills to A, make the right selection, and even if they, they are able to do that, you know, just basic cooking skills on using, you know, homemade produce and cooking basic healthy meals. And though, you know, it's, when you're in a controlled environment, we can influence that, but when they go home, there are generations now, unfortunately, that don't have the skills to be able to, to be healthy and make healthy choices. So what's the panel's view on the things we've been talking about and nudges and habits, how, how do we use those things to influence more things that happen at home? Maybe a quick response from each of you. Uh, well, I mean, I think we, we recognize that and now we have cooking taught for the first time for years in our national curriculum and kids have to learn to make savory as well as sweet dishes, but obviously that's a long haul. And um, I think though, um, I don't think that cooking skills and things like that are the root of this issue because my generation were the first mm. generation not to cook really and we were all taught to cook in school. Um, so I, th I think the skills point is really important but the environmental one is important too so I'm, I'm dodging the question in a way because uh, you know it's, it's this I think this problem is not about silver bullets. Yeah, one of the things we're doing, there's a, a program called Women, Infants, and Children. It's targeted at the, at the people you were talking about, and Sam mentioned it. One of the things we're doing there is there's an instructional part of that. We're focusing instructions on what are the behaviors, not memorizing the, the calories in an apple again, but what are the easy behaviors that you can do and teaching people six simple meals that they can make. Because once they make six things, kind of from scratch, they're a cook. Um, can I just add one thing? We have commissioned work on cooking classes and looking at the effect of that on diet. People have absolutely adored the cooking classes. Um, it's improved their skill, it's improved their knowledge. Has it changed their overall diet? Not a jot. So I think that's an example of sometimes the things that feel like the right things aren't necessarily the right thing. I don't know. Everybody should cook. I just would like you to all join me in please thanking our two guests here today for a fantastic discussion and I hope you enjoy afternoon tea. Thank you. <laughs>